Good evening, everyone. This is Gray1951. I'm here to do uh, a tag video. I can tag. I was just walking along, minding my own business, and I turned around, and there was Forkerball tagging me. So, anyway, the idea behind this tag is to take our names, not our YouTube names, but our real names, and um, take each letter and show a film beginning with that letter. So it's a good idea. So here it is. And my name, as you all know, is this. Mike Wilson. Well, a lot of you don't know what my last name is, but that's that's my last name. Actually, my original name before it was changed, um, my original name in the old country, which is so old that we can't remember the name of the country. This is what my real name actually was when I was born, okay? Which is pronounced, um, how is it pronounced? I keep forgetting. Mika Sandrosi Viscapre Oboy. So that's that's my real name. But uh, if I were going to do this, I'd be here all night. And we don't want that, do we? So I'm going to use the American version, the English version. Mike Wilson. Okay. So here we go. Starting with letter M. This is one of the best, not so good, but terrific low-budget 1950s science fiction movies ever made. This is Missile to the Moon. I absolutely love this movie. 1959. All-star cast, Richard Travis, Kathy Downs, Gary Clark, and Nina Berra. How many films have you seen with Richard Travis? I mean, yeah, okay. Missile to the Moon, it's all about um, scientists and, and a beautiful young lady who end up going to the moon for some reason I really can't remember and they encounter this um, this race of women gorgeous women who live all, all by themselves in a culture with no men that causes all kinds of strange interesting developments and there, there are giant spiders there are rock men that move you know at, at a very slow pace uh, it's, it's an exciting film filled with excitement filled with Filled with special effects that will leave you gasping in awe. Now, the one reason why this movie is not so good is because it's a, it's a remake of an earlier film called Cat Women of the Moon. Cat Women of the Moon starring Marie Windsor, Sonny Tufts, and Victor Jory. Anytime you have a movie with Sonny Tufts, you know it's going to be a classic. Um, they're almost exactly alike, but it's hard to say which one is worse or better, but I highly recommend both of them. They're terrific. Okay, uh, The next one... This is a rather obscure Betty Davis film from the 1940s that a lot of people don't talk about. It's called In This Our Life from the year 1942, directed by John Huston. The second film directed by John Huston, the first one was The Maltese Falcon the year before. So how he got stuck with this, I'm not sure, but I think he was under contract to Warner Brothers. This is pure soap opera from start to finish with a plot that will leave you gasping almost as much as you were gasping with Missile to the Moon. Betty Davis, Olivia de Havilland, George Brent, Dennis Morgan, Hattie McDaniel, Charles Coburn. <clears throat> it is, um, Betty Davis is, the, she's playing probably the, one of the most relentlessly evil and unlikable, well, of course, I guess if you're evil, you're also unlikable, characters that she ever played in films. And uh, it, it, the only way to describe her performance in this is that she's just overwrought from start to finish. I guess that's the best way to do it. But Olivia de Havilland plays her sister. And I thought this would be a good choice considering that just a couple of days ago, Olivia de Havilland celebrated her 100th birthday. So she is one of the last surviving actresses from the golden age of Hollywood. Her career went all the way back to the mid-1930s. She is the last surviving cast member of Gone with the Wind. So it's, it's a real treasure to have her alive. And she gives a good performance in this. She plays the good sister. Now, what's interesting about this, the names of these women, uh, for some reason, the parents in the story, they, they gave their two daughters men's names. Okay, so Betty Davis's name is Stanley Timberlake, probably the great grandmother of Justin Timberlake. And her sister is named Roy Timberlake. So what happens in this, uh, Stanley is a, a total bitch who breaks off her own engagement to run off with her sister's boyfriend, played by Dennis Morgan, and um, she, she, she not only destroys her sister's life, she ends up destroying her own marriage, her, her guy that she ran away with ends up committing suicide because he's so miserable, and while all, all this is going on, she also 
um, has a car accident one night where she she hits a woman walking with her daughter, and um, the the daughter is killed and the woman is in in critical condition, and uh, Betty St uh, Stanley drives off. She does a hit and run, and blames the accident on a young man who happens to be the son of the family maid, played by Hannah McDaniel. The son is played by actor Ernest Anderson. He's a young guy who is uh, very smart and he is uh, studying to be a lawyer. But Stanley feels that if she if he blames, blames this guy, since he's black and the family is white and rich, that they're not, they're not going to believe his alibi, right? So what's interesting about this well, there are a lot of things interesting about it. It's, it's all very hard to believe, but the, the subplot about the, the black man being accused of a crime he didn't commit is, is very, very progressive. And in fact, th this film was not approved for by the wartime, this was during World War II, it was not approved for wartime overseas distribution because it told the truth about racial discrimination in America. And Betty Davis herself, later in her life, she talked about this film. She said it wasn't a very good movie, which it really isn't. But she said that it was the first time that it showed a, a black person, this, this young man played by Ernest Anderson, being uh, a completely intelligent and, um, and, and interesting, you know, fully developed character rather than step and fetch it. And Hattie McDaniel, who of course was famous for playing uh, Mammy in Gone with the Wind, also gives a very um, understated and thoughtful performance. Probably the, one of the few times in films that she was given a chance to just be a very, um, you know, sort of a, a normal woman, a normal person. Anyway, it's a fascinating movie and uh, Betty Davis is her crazy self, okay? Uh, for the letter K, I chose another classic from the golden age. From 1940, this is Kitty Foyle starring Ginger Rogers, Dennis Morgan, James Craig. This is uh, also a soap opera from start to finish, what they used to call women's, a woman's picture back in the day, but it's still, it's still a great movie. Ginger Rogers, of course, for years had been a, a comedian and, and a great dancing star in the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers films at RKO. And this was the first time that she had a chance to do a really dramatic film. And it went over so well that she won the Academy Award for Academy Award for Best Actress. She plays a working class Irish girl from Philadelphia who, who is uh, very envious of the, the high class rich people of Philadelphia and ends up falling in love with uh, the son of one of these families. And it ends up, it all ends up very, very sad, very tragically. Very, very good film, something I can watch again and again. For the letter E, I chose another classic 1950s science fiction film, this time a really good one called Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Um, great special effects for the time, but it really isn't so much the special effects. It's just the whole atmosphere of the film, an invasion of uh, uh, these, these spacemen come to Earth to because their planet is dying, and uh, they, it ends up being a battle royal between our military and our scientists trying to defeat these invaders, and it's all very good. It's all very dramatic. Earth versus the Flying Saucers. If you haven't seen it, if you love science fiction from that era, you will definitely like this. Okay, for the letter W, I've chosen a, a, a low-budget classic from 1962 called Wild Guitar. Wild Guitar. This is put out by Something Weird Video on a double bill with, double bill with a film called The Choppers. Both of these movies star Arch Hall Jr. And if you don't know anything about Arch Hall Jr., I've talked about him in uh, several videos. He, he's definitely worth knowing about if you like low-budget cult films from this era. Um, it's all about a guy named Bud Eagle, who's probably the most naive character uh, that you could ever meet. He's a guitar player and a singer. He writes music. He hitchhikes from Colorado to Los Angeles to try to make it as a singer, right? A guitar player and a singer, and encounters all kinds of obstacles. Actually, becomes he gets a chance to become a star virtually overnight. He meets up with uh, a, a shady, uh, exploitative... Um, manager played by a, an actor named William Waters who really takes advantage of Bud until Bud finally figures out what's going on and tries to fight back. And William Waters happens to be a fake name 
for Arch Hall Sr., who, of course, is the, the father of Arch Hall Jr. And he was the producer of a lot of Arch's films, appeared in a lot of them under a, an assumed name. He also uh, produced, well, he is a producer of this film under another phony name, Nicholas Merriweather, okay? And the film was directed by Ray Dennis Steckler, who is pretty well known for being another low-budget film director and actor um, of, of films that, that I, I love, films like The Thrill Killers and uh, my one of my favorites, The Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. I know you all like that one, but this is a very good little movie. Ray Dennis Steckler also acts in this film under his pseudonym, Cash Flag, okay? So it's, it's just a lot of fun. The music's cool. Arch Hall Jr. is a very cool character, and uh, he's still around. He's in his 70s. Uh, he, after he left his very brief film career, he became a commercial pilot, had to retire at the uh, mandatory age of 60. Now he's, I think he's about 71, 72, I don't know. And he's, he uh, appears at conventions and plays his guitar and sings. So great guy. Uh, for the letter I, I chose... Uh, a Woody Allen film called Interiors. Now, a couple of days ago on Facebook, somebody was talking about Woody Allen. I can't remember now who it was exactly. Well, actually, it was it was um, Ian Forkerball asked people if he was going to see a Woody Allen film, what would they recommend? And somebody recommended Interiors. I think it was Ryan Chataway, and he said that this is one of his favorite Woody Allen films. And I actually I actually love this movie. This came out in 1978. It was Woody Woody Allen's first serious film. The previous year, he had made Annie Hall, which was an Academy Award-winning film, a film that everybody liked. It's probably Woody Allen's best comedy and may arguably his best film. But So he came back and he decided to do something, just a total reversal. Uh, this film, which, which is really an homage to Ingmar Bergman, who, who was somebody that Woody Allen has always admired. And he decided not to appear in this film because he thought that if he was in it, people would only see him as a comedian. They would not be able to take him seriously. So he, he has people like uh, Diane Keaton, Mary Beth Hurt, E.G. Marshall, Geraldine Page, Maureen Stapleton, Stan Waterston, Kristen Griffith. The story is about this family, E.G. Marshall and Geraldine Page have been married for a long time, and they have three daughters, Kristen Griffith, Mary Beth Hurt, and Diane Keaton, all of whom are very intelligent women, very different. And the woman, Geraldine Page, is an, an interior decorator who uh, specializes in very sparse interiors with very light muted colors. Everything is white, everything's beige or a little bit of gray. And she, she has this attitude about herself and her family. She tries to order everyone's life in the same way that she direct, that she um, decorates direct decorates the interiors of, of her home and other people's home and and after a lifetime of this the husband decides he can't take it anymore and he tells her he wants to leave and get a divorce she goes mental and uh, he comes back to the family to his daughters with uh, uh, another woman that he's fallen in love with played by played by uh, Jer uh, Maureen Stapleton who was a complete the complete opposite of his wife. She's full of life. She's very funny. She's very warm. She wears bright and dark colors um, that, you know, such a contrast to the wife. Anyway, it's a fascinating film. Did not get a lot of critical praise at the time. Still doesn't really. A lot of people don't like it because they think that it's, uh, it just comes off as being very shallow. I don't agree. I absolutely love it. Okay, the next film for the letter L, I picked The Lady from Shanghai. 1947, a film noir directed by and written by Orson Welles, starring Orson Welles along with his wife at the time, Rita Hayworth. Now, this is this is a fascinating film. I, I chose this because I saw this on the big screen just a couple of nights ago. It was playing here at the Art Theater in Champaign, and it was only the second time I'd seen it. Um, it it's a beautiful film to look at with all the, the beautiful darkness and the light and the shadows that you that you see in classic film noirs and Orson Welles could do that better than anybody but it it what it doesn't have in my opinion is a believable and coherent story but beyond that it has great performances by everyone involved especially Rita Hayworth she's very very good in this keep in mind this was a year after she made the ultimate Rita Hayworth experience Gilda Okay, that was everything Rita Hayworth did in her career, which started back in the mid-1930s, 
went up to Gilda and peaked. That was that was the absolute epitome of her career, and then after that was a slow decline. But The Lady from Shanghai is a very, very worthwhile film to see, okay? The next film for the letter S, this is a film that I, I never heard of until recently, but I saw it in one of my film classes. It's called Seeking a Friend for the End of the World, okay? From 2011, it stars Steve Carell and Kira Knightley. It has to do with, it's, it's a contemporary story about scientists realizing that the world is about to end because uh, uh what is it a 70 mile wide asteroid is making its way to the earth and there's nothing in the world that anybody can do to stop it i know you've heard you've heard that plot before in other disaster films but this one is done for mainly black comedy but also it has a very poignant side to it as well so th these two neighbors who didn't know each other beforehand steve carell and kira knightley they end up on sort of a road trip to basically fulfill their last wishes. Steve Carell wants to find the woman that he first, his first love, because he never really got over her. So they're traveling to another town. She's trying to find a way to get back to her family in England so that she can experience the end of the world in the, in the arms of her family. So it's really a very interesting little movie and uh, I would highly recommend it. Didn't have a lot of films starting with the letter O, so I picked a favorite out of the past Classic film noir from 1947. Robert Mitchum, Jane Greer, and Kirk Douglas. Um, what can I say? It's a beautiful film to look at. Great performances by all, everybody involved. Really, it's one of the best things that Robert Mitchum ever did. It's one of those uh, classic movies that you can watch again and again and again and never get tired of it. So... You need to watch it. And for the letter N, to end my little video, this is a Martin Scorsese film that doesn't get a lot of um, doesn't get a lot of mention by a lot of people who who likes Scorsese. This is called New York, New York. It's a musical drama made in 1977 or 78, 77, starring Liza Minnelli and Robert De Niro. It's about um, Robert De Niro. This was a couple of years after he did Taxi Driver. He looks pretty much the same. He's not quite as uh, crazed, crazed looking. He's got a better haircut, but he's still lean and mean and very cynical, very funny. And he's a saxophone player who, who has just, just gotten out of the war. It, it, this happens, this all starts on uh, VJ Day when everybody's celebrating in America. And uh, he meets Liza Minnelli, who is a former USO musician, singer, and they, they have this crazy beginning to a re what turns out to be a very loving relationship and they end up getting married. And she starts singing with the band that he has formed after the war. And then they have all these crazy conflicts and uh, not only personal conflicts, career conflicts, ambition conflicts, and they end up splitting up. And it's, it's, it has a lot of comedy in it and a lot of terrific music. Of course, Robert De Niro doesn't really play the saxophone, but Liza Minnelli is at the peak of her ability as a singer, and she, she's also a very good actress in this film. And it, it, it's very nostalgic, but at the same time, it's also very downbeat and somewhat depressing. It does not have a happy ending, but it's, it's definitely, definitely worth seeing. It's interesting that Scorsese at the time was romantically involved with Liza Minnelli. And he seemed to have a kind of an obsession with Liza Minnelli and Judy Garland. And it's it, what's interesting about, another thing interesting about it is that Liza Minnelli had always said when she was growing up as a young woman and, and establishing her career that she would never try to imitate her mother. Well, actually, and that's exactly what happens in this film. She ends up looking a lot like her mother and dressing like her and there are a couple of a couple of shots of her where you, you would think that you are seeing Judy Garland you know come back to life it's it's eerie but uh, there, there are a lot of good things about this movie and it's uh, it's worth checking out okay so anyway that's my video for the tag and uh, thank you for um, inviting me to do this I'm going to do what what Ian and James both did and they just tagged anybody who would like to play along so that's that's what I'm going to do. So if you want to do this, just uh, take your name, take the short version, and uh, play along. Okay? Thanks for watching.